everyone, and welcome back to Another Bite, where we rewatch the most innovative and intriguing pitches from Shark Tank. I'm Ariel, and I'm joined today by John. Hello, everybody. Love the energy. Yeah. I'm here, Ariel. How are you? I'm great, John. I have a question for you. Yeah? What do you get when you blend culinary creativity with cutting-edge technology? Answer? Hmm. A slap chop? Mm, close. How about something that's three times the amount as expensive and doesn't have the same reliability? Oh, sounds not great. Answer, Chefy, <laughs> A robotic chef that's shaking up mealtime. Will this robo sous chef whisk our sharks off their feet or will our sharks tell them to beat it? Stay tuned after we whip up this ad. Is it just me or does it feel like the marketing playbook is always changing? Much like the age old question to skinny jean or to not skinny jean, marketing strategies can come and go and come back again. Who can keep up? Luckily, HubSpot makes it their job to keep marketers on trend and on track to hit their goals. Their 2024 State of Marketing Report is the all-in-one guide for everything happening this year and how marketers can best approach it all. HubSpot surveyed more than 1,400 marketing pros across the world and curated the top trends they're thinking about. Sure, there's AI, but there's so much more. The report covers everything from increasing awareness and engagement to ensuring privacy and boosting efficiency and growth. You get all the info you need to shape your strategy for the year and keep on winning into next year. Don't get caught hopping on an old trend. Visit HubSpot.com slash state hyphen of hyphen marketing to get your free copy of the report. So today in the tank, we have Sheffy brought to us by founder Asaf Pasut. He is asking for $500,000 investment for a 4% stake in his company coming out to a 12.5 million valuation. Oof. So you're probably wondering, what is Sheffy? Sheffy is the world's first embedded robotic chef for your kitchen. And it solves the problem that cooking is hard. We don't have time nowadays to cook. We rely on a lot of robots to automate things like my Roomba, my day-to-day -day schedule, automating calendars, even coming up with puns. Driving my car. Yeah, driving your car. Great example. Driving a bike too. Rocking the baby. Yeah. Whatever, sure. So why not have a robot for everything, including improving your cooking? So Chefy is an app and also a robotic kind of contraption that cooks hundreds of meals. It is a two set. So if you imagine you go into your kitchen, you have your top of your shelves is filled with a variety of different dry and refrigerated goods. The bottom of your stove is essentially a robotic integration that will take the ingredients that you have from the top, chop them up, weigh them out, make sure they are the perfect distribution and portions to make anything that you want from paella to soups to rice bowls. I have a world of options with Sheffy. So based off of the initial product, the intro, the concept, what were you thinking about this one, John? Well, okay. First of all, when I heard Robotic Chef, I envisioned something like the Tesla Optimus bot or whatever. And I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, am I actually putting like a humanoid robot in my house and going to give it a knife? It seems like a horrible idea. It's like smart house all over again. <laughs> yeah. You like come into your kitchen and the Optimus bot like turns with like two knives and you're like, ah! <laughs> So first I was a little thrown off, but then when I got to know what this system was, it kind of became a little bit more interesting to me. You did a good job explaining it all that like to put a finer point on it. It reminded me of like a library card catalog. I'm not sure everybody here remembers the library card catalog. You look up the numbers. Lots of like little drawers. Yeah. yeah. So this is actually one of my big concerns about this thing is like, mm. I'm like, on the one hand, how cool. You have drawers of ingredients in cabinets and they're all little and they look all cool and colorful and bright and all the possibilities and the robot can make the possibilities into paella. That should be Love their tagline. Big paella fan. On the other hand, I'm like, am I going to have to like become like a Dewey Decimal System manager in order to like sort all this food? Like, how am I going to fill this drawer with garlic every week? Am I going to have to like peel all this garlic, like so much garlic to peel and one pop to put it in this drawer. So it's interesting as a product. I do believe that robots will really assist us domestically, actually. And mm -hmm. I can see cooking being one of the big tasks that kind of gets handled. But compared to just getting like food delivery service or even hiring a private chef, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that the cost of this solution nor the complexity would really deliver on the solving the problem in the most cost effective and efficient way. 
Yeah, let's get into the cost effective and the numbers a little bit here. Yeah. So looking at just the basic version, which does not include a refrigeration model, as our founder relates. So this is dry ingredients only, integrating everything. It comes out to $9,500. And then if you want a more premium version for more refrigeration, for multiple modules, to really get the full product that he was actually showing on the tank, it comes out to 40 k to 50 k yeah, it's 40 grand to get this thing installed in your kitchen. Yes. You could hire a chef for cheaper. Yeah. Private chefs, like 20 bucks an hour, something like that, mm-hmm. to have somebody come and cook meals for you and meal prep for you on an afternoon and then leave you with a whole bunch of delicious, really good, healthy meals made exactly to your specifications and to your tastes and stuff like that. You don't have to like go in an app to do any of it. Like you don't have to figure out what it wants. You don't have to buy any of the ingredients and put them in things. And sure, there's like a HelloFresh integration or whatever, but like I'd rather just get a human being who's really talented at cooking and pay them if I was going to do this. Because I don't think a lot of people are going to buy the low-end model. No. Like if you're like going all in on a robot chef for your kitchen, if you've got 10 grand to splurge on that, you probably got 20 or 30 grand or 40 grand to spend on it actually. Mm -hmm. Does the 10K model only make paella? Yeah. Because I like paella, but like I don't want paella like three times a week, you know? So... I had a lot of concerns about it. That said, whether or not it is a great product or not, we have no idea if it's a good business or not. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what matters most to Shark Tank. They're pre-revenue. They've installed three of them. And they're coming, seeking a really large investment. It's just so hard to imagine that the sharks are going to be able to get any sort of return on this. They like to invest in cash flow businesses This is like a long-term robotics play. You're going to have manufacturing capabilities you're going to have to build. You're going to have all sorts of servicing costs that aren't built into the model yet. So there's a lot, I think, undiscovered in this business model that needs to be sorted out. I think that was my one kind of feedback with his pitch. And, you know, there's nothing wrong with going necessarily on Shark Tank being pre-revenue, right? But really, at the stage that our founder is at, what's really important is showing that you have an understanding of that competitive landscape. You know your stage and you know your business model really well. I would have loved for our founder to maybe lean away from more of like that sales-oriented kind of pitch and talk more about like, hey, we are reaching this luxurious buyer who typically spends, you know, 20000 a year on a chef that they have come in and cook private meals. This is meant to be a replacement for meals at any time in the middle of the night. Like sharing more of that insight around who the audience actually is, I think that could have been something that really could have improved his pitch a little bit. Yeah, he did nothing to describe the market for this mm-hmm. product. And you're right, you can come on to Shark Tank and do a pre-revenue product, but to your point, you need to orient your pitch around describing the market opportunity very clearly so that everybody understands what the opportunity is. You need to say why you'll be differentiated in that market, to your point on the competitive. And you need to basically ask for an amount of money at a valuation that represents the fact that you are pre-revenue. And you know the fact that he's asking for a $12.5 million valuation for a company that's only installed three of these units is just not grounded in reality. Yeah. And there's a few ways that founders can do that, too. Do you look at a scorecard approach, which is based off of benchmarks for other robotic industries? Do you look at it based off of your book value, which is essentially understanding your liabilities from your total assets? Or do you take more of like a VC approach, which is looking at what folks would consider like a terminal value based off of your projections? There's a lot of different ways that you probably could have came to a more reasonable valuation. Yeah. I would just note, Ariel, that almost all of those methods of valuing a company require you to have at least sold a unit. (laughs) (laughs) The three units that he has don't count. Those are free units installed. I don't think he sold (laughs) any of those units. I don't think he has any market validation. You're like, oh yeah, you could do this for, you're right. Those are all valid ways. I think there's only one industry right now where you can get a ludicrous valuation for no revenue and no proof. And that is AI. (laughs) Uh, Otherwise. You're out of luck. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, so we know it's really high price point. How do you go about marketing this, John? Yeah, well, my first thought on it is I do think you need to find a way to position it in the right way. And I think actually the private chef angle is actually a pretty good idea. That's probably how I would go out and position this thing. And my sense is you need to be really strong at positioning. You need to say this is an alternative to something that you can't otherwise get access to. And that's going to dictate his price point. He has to obsess about bringing the price down so that's below a private chef, in my opinion. And I don't think he's there yet. Maybe in the beginning he couldn't, but he should try and get there so that he can say like, this gives everybody access to a private chef so that you can have fresh cooked meals whenever you want them without having to do any of the work. And it's going to save you money over hiring someone to do it. And then he's got to be exceptional at objective handling. 
he needs to be really, really good at saying, I've talked to my three customers many times, <laughs> and I know that here are the main issues they're worried about, and here's why you don't need to worry about those. And you saw the objections start to come up from the sharks, right? Yeah. Number one, they're super stressed about how do they actually get all the ingredients in. Number two, they're super stressed about the servicing of it. Like what happens when it breaks? Right. Like who maintains it? How much do I need to clean it? How do I clean it? How much work is that? So I think you just have to be like really, really good at the objection handling, which would just be a key part, I think, of how he would have to go to market. You bring up a good point around upkeep cost. I actually think this could be a great product for like a B2B space. I would actually discourage him from leaning into direct to consumer because I think this could work really well in instances like office spaces where you have return to the office, you're looking to reduce overhead costs from like your real estate and your operations. So maybe the cafeteria isn't running. Mm -hmm. This could potentially be a solution for a lot of office spaces or like nursing homes. But I think the challenge that he's going to run into there if he focuses on B2B is how long does it actually take to get a single serving of paella? Like we saw in the demonstration, it took, you know, a few minutes. But if you have a whole line of folks lining up during lunchtime, waiting an hour for their paella... And to be honest, getting good paella is all about the crispy crust on the bottom. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the robot has the touch for that, number one. And number two, that takes a long time. Yeah. I don't want fast paella. Right. I want good paella. <laughs> so I think he really needs to go back in some ways. He's so focused on the robotics piece and provided as like, hey, I'm focusing for like an industrial kind of push, like in a B2B space. Or to your point, John, really focusing if he does want to stick with like D to C, maybe it's more based around the value add, the marketing, the savings, and then finding that right price point for the product. Yeah. My advice to him would be to do a full on licensing mm -hmm. approach for this product through high end B to C mm -hmm. kitchen installers. Because you're right about the B to B use case. I think there's willingness to pay there. I think the complexity of maintenance cleaning, yeah. all that stuff gets so complicated in B2B. People have dietary restrictions. Like, how are you going to be sure it's clean between each one? You know, like, yeah. so there's willingness to pay there, but the things that are objections are like Core amplified operation. dramatically yeah. and much bigger risk for an employer. Whereas, you know, people who are buying mansions and installing, you know, sub-zero everything might be willing to drop an extra 40K on the robotic kitchen. And I bet a lot of people would think that's really interesting. And I bet builders of these high-end models would also find it really interesting. So that to me becomes the path that I would probably go down. I'm not sure he should go it alone. Yeah. He might just want to say like, hey, I've built this whole system, got it all figured out. Sell it off. I'm willing to sell the business right now for X million dollars. And on the one hand, he might not get as big of a return because he doesn't have any momentum yet. Sure. But it's still millions of dollars for him as like the only owner of the company. It's still an amazing life-changing outcome. Mm -hmm. So that's probably what I would do. Yeah. I'd get it into the hands of someone who knows how to distribute 40 plus thousand dollar kitchen equipment. I think that's really great advice too. And even like just looking at our founder, he seems so much more of like an innovator personality, a little less of like, hey, I'm more of like a business entrepreneurial spirit. It's more of like, I want to innovate, make really cool things with robotics. So like, I yeah. think going into our shark responses, you know, Mark had a lot of experience in like the robotics space. So I feel like he gave some really great feedback to our founder here. He says he wants him to admit that he's an integrator and not necessarily a chef. So there is a little bit of some discussion around how to kind of position this product, how to, you know, communicate what the value add is. Kevin eventually comes in. He says he wants to make an offer of 500,000K for 15%. We have a soft who counters with 8% and then they offer 12% little bit of back and forth there and end up at a 15% offer, which I was very surprised that he ended up getting a deal from Mr. Wonderful. I feel like this episode, Kevin was, was just very generous uh, with all the deals this episode. <laughs> you know, it's coming to the end of the season. It's he didn't fill his quota, maybe. So as you know, ended up walking away with the deal. So hopefully time will tell and maybe we'll see Sheffy around in market. Yeah. Production for today's episode was brought to you by Ari Desarmo. Editing comes from Robert Hartwig and support from Alfred Schultz. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify Podcasts, or wherever you subscribe to the greatest podcasts ever. That does it for me. See you next week in the tank for another bite. I want to take a break to tell you about a podcast coming to the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. It's called The Next Wave. AI and the Future of Technology. It's hosted by Matt Wolf and Nathan Lands. 
AI technology is transforming the way we do business, and the media landscape is currently fragmented. The next wave is leading the pack on AI technology and how you can apply it to growing your business. Matt and Nathan are leading AI creators and your guiding light in the AI and technology frontier. Listen to the next wave wherever you get your podcasts.